Well, good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to you, a very warm welcome to you all on this very special service for Palm Sunday. It's lovely to have you with us. Let's just quiet our hearts for a moment, and then we we'll begin. Palm Sunday is one of the enigmas in the Christian calendar. It speaks of joy and celebration, and of worshiping Jesus as the King of Kings. And yet, of course, it leads us into the events of Holy Week the memory of sorrow and suffering, and finally death on a cross. We cannot think of one without the other, and any talk of the majesty of Jesus must be understood in the light of all that followed. The one we serve came to serve others. The Lord of life endured the darkness of death. The way to the throne involved the costly path of sacrifice. It is easy enough to sing Christ's praises and acknowledge him as Lord, it is a different matter to take up our cross and follow him. Yet that is the homage he asks of us and the challenge this day brings. As we offer today our glad hosannas, let us ask ourselves if we are really also willing to offer ourselves in his service. And so, grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you now and forever. And so together we say the words of our introductory prayer. We've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. And so now we're going to sing together our first hymn on this Palm Sunday morning. It's All Glory, Lord and Honour. Children, please. 
And so now we come to our time of confession. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. And so together we say, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. So now we have a special prayer of thanksgiving, not just for Palm Sunday, but for Passion Tide. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation, to you be praise and glory forever. As a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, your only Son was lifted up that he might draw the whole world to himself. May we walk this day in the way of the cross and always be ready to share its weight declaring your love for all the world. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. So now Mike Bennett is going to bring us our reading. Our reading is today is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11, the triumphal entry. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jer Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus! the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now David Moncaster is going to bring God's word to us. Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention to the Scriptures, may your Holy Spirit guide our thoughts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am sure you are aware that today is Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter Day, and the occasion when we celebrate what is often called the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. If, like me, you are a long-time churchgoer, this annual service will be well known to you, and the scripture reading we have just heard will be very familiar. So there is a danger that we switch off and assure ourselves that we already know not just these events, but also their significance. This gives the preacher a bit of a problem. 
how am I going to attract and hold your attention? Perhaps by starting with a personal reflection. Whilst pondering this reading from Matthew's Gospel in preparation for today, I was struck by the thought that in my days at Sunday school, many years ago, we youngsters were given literal branches cut from someone's garden to wave enthusiastically as we acted out the story. Sadly, we didn't have a real donkey. Nowadays, in the Church of England, as we arrive, we are usually handed a so-called palm formed into the shape of a cross, which, during the service, we might be persuaded to hold up in rather an embarrassed way. Certainly nothing so inelegant as frantic waving. Is that what Palm Sunday is all about? Waving palms? Of course not. Let's look at what Matthew records for us to see what lessons we can learn. Firstly, what can we say about these circumstances? Well, from the first three verses of our reading from Matthew chapter 21, we learn that Jesus and his disciples, probably quite a large number, not just the 12 apostles, are approaching Jerusalem and they have reached Bethphage on the Mount of Olives on the eastern outskirts of the city. Jesus sends two disciples into the village ahead to collect a donkey and her colt with precise instructions as to where they will be found and as to what they are to say if challenged. We are not told how or when Jesus had prearranged to borrow these animals, but clearly he had done so. This was not a last minute, spur of the moment thing. Jesus had planned it. Secondly, we can notice from verse 4 that Matthew is immediately at pains to emphasize that this happened to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah, which in verse 5 he quotes, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We must ask ourselves why Matthew makes this link with the Old Testament prophecy remembering that originally his gospel was addressed to a largely Jewish audience who would know the scripture and recognize Zechariah's writings. In the ancient world, a king would ride a white stallion to make a spectacular entrance and would show no sign of humility and he would not defer to God or anyone else. As usual, Jesus turns the world's ideas and values upside down. His triumphal entry was not about conquering and subjecting people, or boasting of success or authority or power. It was about triumph over evil and death, through suffering and obedience. Jesus knew what he was doing and had planned this event. His public fulfilling of the scriptures was probably little understood at the time. But with hindsight and the gospel accounts, we are able to see the events of Palm Sunday as part of a wider series of events. Now we are able to see what it was all about and to rejoice that Jesus went through with his Father's will, setting his face as a flint in his determination to go to Jerusalem. 
Personally, I don't think the disciples or the crowd had at this stage the slightest inkling of the cross at Calvary that soon was to be where Jesus gave his life for the ransom of mankind. To us, the cross does not seem out of place in the narrative. But on that original day, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the atmosphere was the exact opposite of grief and mourning. It was festival time. All roads leading into Jerusalem would have been heaving with pilgrims approaching the city for the important feast of Passover. There was a joyous sense of anticipation and the crowds were ready to celebrate. So when Jesus joined the throng riding into the city like a triumphant king with his disciples paving the way with their cloaks and branches cut from the trees, folks were ready to participate. Great numbers of them would have recognized Jesus as a popular teacher and preacher who had performed marvelous miracles of healing and deliverance. Now, perhaps, they were ready to recognize his kingship, believing that the kingdom of which he had spoken was indeed at hand. So, enthusiastically, they joined in the laying of cloaks and branches. They sang and chanted. Using the Hebrew expression, Hosanna, which means save, and which had become an expression of praise, they used the words of Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And although Matthew doesn't quote them, the further words from verse 27 of that psalm, with bows in hand, join in the festal, festal procession up to the horns of the altar, chime with the crowd's laying of branches. Perhaps they were beginning to recognize Jesus as king, even the Messiah. But like the apostles, they still firmly associated the coming of the chosen one as a restoration of Israel, as in the glory days of King David. I have a question for you. Why was Jesus not arrested by the Roman authorities for setting himself up as a triumphant king riding into Jerusalem? An obvious answer could be that the Romans didn't know about it. This seems unlikely. The Romans would have been very aware that Jerusalem, packed with excitable pilgrims, was a potential tinderbox for a rebel to start trouble for them. I think the answer must be that they didn't understand what was happening. After all, a preacher on a donkey doesn't seem much of a threat, and a crowd doing crazy things like spreading cloaks and palm branches for the donkey to walk on could be dismissed as ignorant exuberance of peasants up from the country getting overexcited at coming to the big city. Why the Jewish rulers and Pharisees who knew who we know were plotting against Jesus didn't report him is a harder question to answer, as is the question as to why they didn't quote this incident as evidence when Jesus was on trial before Pilate. However, enough of this speculation Let's focus on what we can see clearly. We can see that Jesus planned this event in order to make public his entry into Jerusalem. He also accepted the public adoration of the pilgrims. This is very interesting because we know from many instances in the Gospels that Jesus was constantly telling those he had healed not to tell anyone about it. So why go public now? 
I think the answer is twofold. We know from other parts of the Gospel writings that Jesus had set his face as a flint towards Jerusalem and he wasn't going to sneak into the city quietly. He was not afraid to face the suffering that he knew was inevitable. He would enter Jerusalem publicly. And the second part of the answer is, I believe, that Jesus was deliberately fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. <clears throat> we know from many instances that Jesus knew the scriptures very well. And previously, in the Sermon on the Mount, he had told the disciples that he had come to fulfill the law and the prophets. So Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah by riding as a king on a donkey, accepting the recognition of the crowds and entering Zion, Jerusalem, the holy city. And when he got there, Matthew tells us in verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Clearly the crowds accompanying Jesus in the triumphal procession knew him as the healer and teacher from Nazareth. <clears throat> and now they acknowledged him as a prophet. Many of them had probably been healed by Jesus. Most of them had at some time probably heard him teaching. And most of them being devout Jewish pilgrims, having come up to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, would be aware of Zephaniah's prophecy of the king coming to them, riding on a donkey. They possibly also remembered that the prophecy starts with the injunction, rejoice greatly. Today is the start of Holy Week leading up to Easter Day next Sunday. It would be good to use this time as an opportunity to ponder afresh the lessons we can learn from Palm Sunday. It was not a mistake. It was planned. It was a public statement and fulfilled the scriptural prophecy Although not fully understood by those present, we are privileged to look back and to see it as part of a series of events in God's plan for our salvation. Jesus is king, but not like an earthly king. Kingdom of God values of humil humility, suffering and obedience are contrary to this world's values. And perhaps the most important lesson for us this morning, it is an occasion to be celebrated. Rejoice greatly, shout, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. Hosanna! Hallelujah. Amen. And so now we're going to sing our second hymn this morning, which is Ride On, Ride On in Majesty.
So now we're going to declare together our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And so together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May Almighty God strengthen this faith in us. So now we have our special prayer, our colic prayer for this day, which is, of course, for Palm Sunday. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now we have what's known as the blessing of the palms. God our Saviour, whose Son Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die, let these palms be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now Carol Hicks is going to lead us in our prayers and intercessions and she'll conclude with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together on this Palm Sunday. Father, as the crowds welcomed Jesus and sang your praises, we welcome you into our hearts and lives over the coming year. We pray for opportunities to spread your good news and courage to take them. Father, we recall the donkey Jesus rode on and we pray for that real humility in our hearts which treats status and image casually and truth and loving service seriously. Father, as the children sang and shouted their praises, we pray for that same innocent trust in our lives and the confidence to shout your praises in our homes, our city, and our land. Father, the crowds were responding to the healing love they had seen in action in Jesus. We bring to you in our love and imagination now all the parts of our lives which need your healing and help. Give us comfort and assurance, wholeness and hope. Father, we too spread our coats on the road as we express our thankfulness for all you have done for us and the amazing extent of your love. You are our God. We welcome you. Clip, clop, clip, clop. Hosanna, Hosanna, hooray for Jesus, the king on a donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna, clip, clop, clip, clop the one who created us, comes willingly to suffer for us. Let us spread our resolve before him like branches of palms. And gathering our prayers and praises into one as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so our final hymn this morning is Make Way, Make Way. Make way, make way for Christ the King, King Splendor arise. Fling wide the gates and welcome Him into your lives. Make way, make way for the King of Kings. Make way, make way, and let His kingdom be. He comes the to our closing prayer and blessing. Lord Jesus Christ, teach us today not just to welcome you as King, but also to commit ourselves to your kingdom, putting our lives at your disposal for you to use as you will. Take our faith, our witness and service, our gifts, time and money, our thoughts, words and deeds, and use them all to fulfill your royal purpose and to your glory. Amen. So now let us together say the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Well, thank you very much. That brings our service to a close for another week for Palm Sunday. Of course, this week is a very busy week for us. On Thursday evening here at uh, Necton Parish Church, we have a service of Holy Communion to, at seven, uh, half past seven to commemorate Maundy Thursday. And then there will be a Good Friday service at, here also at Necton at two o'clock, a meditative type service. Then on Easter Day, we have three services. We have a service of Holy Communion at Necton at 10 o'clock, morning worship followed by Holy Communion at Home Hell at quarter past 11, and another service of Holy Communion at North Pickenham Church at a quarter past 11. So please join us if you can uh, in person. It would be lovely to see you on Easter Day to celebrate the resurrection. But if you can't, then look out for this link online. You know you're always welcome to join us here. So in the meantime, take care, goodbye, God bless, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.
If you would like to support the ministry of any of the churches within the Necton Benefice, then please see the notes under this service on the YouTube channel for All Saints Necton. Or you can now give to each of the churches by using the QR codes which follow. Just pause the video at the code of your choice, scan it using the appropriate app on your phone, and you'll be taken directly to the diocesan donation page for that particular church. God bless and thank you for your support.